a prayer in persecution. A prayer in persecution. David is going through a lot here, and uh, he's uh, going to teach us how to handle these things when difficulty comes. The Bible says, I believe it's in the same book of the Bible, that a man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. We're going to have trouble in this life. And the question is not how we're how we going to have trouble. The question is how we're going to deal with it. How we're going to handle the trouble and trials uh, that we go through in this life. Psalm 35, and we're going to read all verse, verses 1 through 28 here. I encourage you to follow along as I read aloud. Psalm 35, verse number 1. David says, I plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause have they hid for me their net in a pit which without cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him at unawares, and let his net that he hath hid catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivers the poor from him that is too strong for him, yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into my own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. But in my adversity, they rejoiced, and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. They did tear me and ceased not. With hypocritical mockers in feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eye have seen it. This thou hast seen, O Lord. Keep not silence. O Lord, be not far from me. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, ah, so would we have it. Let them not say we have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which had pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. 
We find here again the title of the message tonight is a prayer in persecution. Before I forget, I want to welcome our first time visitor tonight, Damien. Right? Good to have you here tonight. Make sure you make him feel welcome. So glad that he's with us visiting tonight. Trust that the service will be a blessing to you, sir, tonight. Glad you're here. David here prays a desperate cry for help. By the way, let me just say right here, aren't you glad that God is a very present help in our time of need? Amen. Amen. Thankful for that. I'm thankful that Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 33, verse 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I'm glad Jesus said in Matthew 6, and verse 32, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Aren't you glad God knows what we need? Amen. Amen. And I'm uh, thankful for that. And uh, when we pray, just remind ourselves of this, uh, we are not informing God when we pray. God knows all things, but we are inviting God uh, when we pray. And uh, that's the thing that we need to get a hold of. Now, prayer, we need to understand this. There's several statements that I want to make. I trust to get help to you. And this is one of them. That prayer is much more than simply making God aware of our needs. Prayer is making us aware of who God is. I want to say that again. Prayer is much more than simply making God aware of our needs. Prayer is making us aware of who God is. You say, well, I know there is a God. Well, okay. But are you aware of God all day throughout the day? You know how to gauge that? How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? All right. And uh, when we are praying, uh, we are making uh, God is using that to make us aware of who he is. And by the way, you'll never graduate from that school. Being aware of who he is. Amen. Uh, you'll never get to the depth of that. You'll never get to the height of that. Uh, you'll never get to the riches. You'll never uh, understand uh, it just deeper and deeper and greater and greater and more and more wonderful into the heart of God and who he is. And prayer helps us do that, makes us aware of who God is. Let me ask you a question tonight. Right, right tonight where you are tonight, um, what are you learning more about God right now through your prayer life? What is God teaching you about himself right now in your prayer life? How is he revealing himself to you in your prayer life? God will show himself to you in your prayer life. You see, it's just it's not just what he can do. So many people look at prayer that way. Just what God can do. I'm glad for what God can do. What God can do. A friend, far greater than what God can do is who God is. We need to understand who God is. He says here in verse number one of Psalm 35, he says, Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Then he says, fight against them that fight against me. You know, a good question for us to consider tonight is, what side of the fight are we on? If somebody prayed this, if somebody prayed this, uh, would you be fighting with God or would you be fighting against God? God says here, or David says here, fight against them that fight against me. He says in verse 2, take hold of shield and buckler. And stand up for mine help. Draw out also the spear. And stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Aren't you glad we serve a God that is mighty in battle? Amen for that. He is thankful for that. And he fights for his people. Amen. You wouldn't be here tonight if God didn't fight for you. Amen. You would not be here tonight if that were not true. All right. Thank God that God uh, is victorious and God fights for his people. Three simple thoughts I want to draw around our attention as we look at this 35th Psalm. And again, with all these, you're tempted to take about six months on every one of them. I keep reminding myself if we just stop on every one of them for one week, it's going to take us three years to get through all 150. But there's just so much in all these Psalms. And we're only, we could just go through these 150 and then we go right back through them and, uh, and get totally different things. And then three years later and three years later, and of course, never exhausted. Three things tonight give our, give our attention to that I want you to consider tonight in your own heart, your own life. Number one, I want you to consider the devices of the wicked. 
the devices of the wicked in verses 4 through 8. The devices of the wicked. So you have this prayer. David here is praying and asking God to help him. And then in verses 4 through 8 that we'll read here now, we'll see here the devices of the wicked. He says in verse 4, Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind. And let the angels of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery. And let the angels of the Lord persecute them. Notice verse 7. For without cause have they hid from me their net in a pit. Which without cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him at unawares. And let his net that he hath hid catch himself. Into that very destruction let him fall. David here is dealing with wicked people. And these wicked people, David said, have tried to trap him, tried to ensnare him. And he prayed uh, that they would get caught in their own trappings. And, you know, God does that sometimes, does he not? You know, Paul prayed something similar. Paul prayed in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. 2 Timothy 4, 14. Paul said, the Lord reward him according to his works. The Lord reward him according to your work, according to his works. One of the great lessons that we need to learn in life is that we need to leave our enemies in God's hands. Leave them in God's hands. Allow the Lord to fight for you. He says in verse number one again, he says, Lord, in verse number one, plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. And then he says, fight against them that fight against me. The devices of the wicked. The second thought I want us to draw our attention to for a few minutes tonight is the dependence of David. The dependence of David. And really that's the great question that you and I will face. The question is not, uh, will there be wicked people? There will be wicked people. And as I said on Sunday, when you go to work this week and and, and you've got to work with wicked people. Guess what sinners do? They sin. Wicked people all around you. You have wicked people in your family. You have wicked people in your neighborhood. You have wicked people on your job. You have wicked people all around you. All right? The question is not, uh, is there going to be wicked people? The question is, what are you going to do in those times when wicked people will come against you? Notice with me the dependence of David. And look at verse number 9. And he says, and my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. Aren't you glad that you can be joyful in the Lord no matter what? Amen. Aren't you glad that David didn't have to say in verse number nine, you know, if it weren't for these wicked people trying to trap me, I could be joyful. Well, if you get your joy from wicked people, you're not going to have much joy, are you? But guess what? If you get your joy from the Lord, you'll always be joyful. Does that make sense? Amen? We can always rejoice in the Lord, all right? We can be joyful all the time. We may not be happy all the time. I've said this before, I'll say it again. Happiness depends on happenings. If your happy is good, you're happy. If your happy is bad, you're unhappy. We're not commanded to be happy all the time, all right? If so, then we've got a big problem. Jesus wasn't happy all the time, all right? And, uh, and he did not violate his word, obviously. We're not going to be happy all the time, but we can rejoice all the time. And we can be joyful all the time. And there's a big difference. The joy of the Lord is our strength, and our joy comes from the Lord. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. Boy, there is just a joy when we give situations to the Lord. When we just give it to the Lord and say, all right, God, you got this. You got to take care of this. You have all power. You, you understand this situation. And, and it shall, and, I, and my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. Verse number nine, it shall rejoice, speaking of his soul, in his salvation. Friend, if God never did anything else for you, you have something to be rejoicing about your whole life and all of eternity. Amen. Amen. Just salvation, right? Right there, God, God, God didn't know you that. And if he did nothing else for you, if you had a totally miserable life, and you don't, and I don't, 
But if you had a totally miserable life and went to heaven, God was still beyond measure better to you than you deserve. Yeah. Amen? Amen? We always ought to rejoice in salvation. All right? Rejoice in salvation. And by the way, when, when the wicked get around, it ought to cause you to rejoice. Praise God, this ain't it. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to heaven. Praise the Lord. This, we're not, hey, amen. We're not going to be around this anymore. And this is interesting. Uh, I want to draw this to our attention in verse number 10 in just a moment. Let me, um, before we get to verse number 10, you know, I, I want to say this, that much of God's work has been hindered by God's people trying to fight their own battles. Much of God's work has been hindered by God's people trying to fight their own battles. All right. There is a God in heaven who is ready to fight for us. We just need to let him do that. We just need to call upon him. Now, when we are talking about David here, David, a man uh, who uh, asked God to fight his battles, let's remind ourselves who this man is. This is one of the greatest all time man's man who's ever lived. I mean, an all time warrior. I mean, an all time man's man here. We'll not turn there, but if you take a notes, you can write the verse down in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 18. The Bible calls him a valiant man, a valiant man. I mean, he was, he was referred by people in scripture as a valiant man. But when his enemies came upon him here in Psalm 30 or Psalm 35 here, he trusts God and he hands them over to the Lord. I love the story there uh, when the nation of Israel, when David was a young man, of course, that familiar story of David and Goliath. But what I want to draw our attention to for just a moment in that story is that when David shows up on the scene and Goliath is blaspheming God, remember what David said. David said, he didn't just say uh, that I killed a lion and that I killed a bear. Right. He said, God help me kill that lion. And it was God that enabled me to kill that bear. And he said to Saul, it is God that is going to enable me to kill this giant. You see, he gave all the glory to the Lord. It was God that fought his battles. God enabled him to do those things. And so, and, and he did not uh, take the credit. I mean, after he killed Goliath, remember what he said? It is God. It is God that put you in my hands. It is God that gave me this victory. I want us to look at verse number 10. Interesting little study. If you want to uh, take, I'll give you a little seat thought, study thought, and you can take it and run with it yourself. And to be blessed by it. But verse number 10, he talks about the bones. He says, all my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivers the poor from him that is too strong for him, yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. So he's talking about the bones here. And I want you to hold your place, if you would, please. And fast forward in your Bible to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. David here in Psalm 51 talks about the bones. And it's interesting that when you study the bone, you know, you are, you are listening to me speak tonight. And, and, and in a more specific way, it's your bones that's enabling you to hear me tonight. Do I understand that, right? It, it's the bone structure in your ears that catches those vibrations where you can hear. Does that make sense? All right. N notice what David said here as we compare those thoughts. And so look at Psalm 51 and verse number eight. He says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. The thought that I want us to look at these verses here, and it's interesting that in this context of bones, and our text in Psalm 35, he talks about bones and he talks about rejoicing. And in this context here of Psalm 51, he is saying here that I want my bones to be restored, that when my bones are restored, when I get right with God, my bones can be restored. And then he says in verse eight here, he says, 
that I can hear the Lord again. He says, make me to hear joy and gladness. You know, you know what's sad? There's a lot of Christians, sadly, that joy and gladness is all around them, but they don't hear it. They don't hear it. It's not that it's not there, right? I mean, if you, you take someone that is deaf, they'd be foolish to say, well, there is no such thing as sound. No, there is such thing as sound. You're just not able to hear it. You'd be foolish tonight to say, there's no such thing as radio waves in the auditorium. We can bring in a radio in here and turn it on and pick up many stations, right? Absolutely, it is there, all right? But David here, notice the thought here. He says that when I get right with the Lord, my bones are gonna be restored. When my bones are restored, I'm gonna be able to hear from the Lord. And when I hear from the Lord, I'm gonna rejoice in the Lord. And boy, notice that thought there. That if we're not rejoicing in the Lord, it's because we're not hearing from the Lord. We're not hearing from the Lord. We're not right with the Lord. So we need to get right with the Lord so we can hear from the Lord. When we hear from the Lord, we can rejoice in the Lord. Go back in our text in Psalm 35. And again, we see that in verse number 10. He says, all my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivers the poor from him. That is too strong for him. Yea, the poor and the needy from him that spoileth him. David here in these verses uh, is quoting. And I'd like for you to turn back with me to Exodus chapter 14, please. David here is quoting in this portion of the psalm. And you'll, you'll hear some of this as we go back to Exodus 14. David in this psalm quotes a portion of of the song of Moses that we find in Exodus 14 and then in the chapter 15. And what is the characteristics? What is the, what is the, the characteristics of both of these situations? Whether it be Moses on one hand or David on the other hand. And the answer to that is both of them let God fight their battles for them. For Moses, it was that what? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Easier said than done for all of us, isn't it? We, sometimes we just feel like we got to do something. <laughs> Even if it's wrong, we got to do something. No, sometimes we just need to stand still and wait on God. Exodus 14, and, look, and I want you to look at verse 29. I'm going to read into the 15th chapter a little bit about this song of Moses. Exodus 14, 29. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to, unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the land, hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. And spake saying, I will sing unto the Lord. For he, amen, he had tried gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depth have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. In the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood, stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Boy, that's, that's what the world says, doesn't it? Right? I will, I will. About, about five I wills there. 
Compare that with Isaiah 14, where Satan said five times, I will. And friend, we're never more like Satan when we say my will. And we're never more like Jesus when we say thy will. Thy will be done, not my will, thy will be done. Verse 10, verse number 10. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful of praises, doing wonders? David, as we go back to our text in Psalm 35, David said, I'm not going to fight this by myself. I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. I will, like Moses at the Red Sea, who while God enabled him to walk on dry ground, I will depend on the Lord and watch God deliver me. Friend, it ought to be constantly in our minds thinking about God's power and his deliverance. We ought to get up every day thinking about the mighty power of God. Amen. And God is able to do what we need him to do. Look at, if again, look at verse 11, Psalm 35, verse 11. False witnesses did rise up. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothes, and I love this thought. Look at this. He says, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. And my prayer returned in my own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bow down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. Notice how David's behavior was towards them that hate him, that hated him. You know what he did? He did good to them. He said, I humbled myself before them and became their servant. David said, when they were hurting, I was grieved because I loved them. And David said, if you were to look at me grieving when I saw their hurt, you would think that it was some, you would think that I had lost my mother. I was grieving so much at their hurt and their pain. And that's not a natural heart, is it? That's not a natural heart. That's a supernatural heart. Amen. A natural heart says, <laughs> look at them hurting. <laughs> Good. Get what they deserve. That's the natural heart. The Bible says we rejoice with those that rejoice and we weep with those that weep. How could David do this? I'll tell you how David could do this. Only God. See, David had given his heart to God. And God had in return given his heart to him. This is the heart of God. Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. That's the heart of God. Amen? That's the heart of God. Only God can give us a heart like that. People with a heart for God will speak the truth in love. People with a heart for God will take a strong stand, but they'll do it with the right spirit. People with a heart for God will face their enemies, but will not become like them. Many a Christian has been ruined. Many a Christian has been ruined by retaliating when attacked. Difficulties will come. The question is, how do we handle them? Dr. Lee Robertson, I've heard this quote many years ago and never have forgotten it. Dr. Lee Robertson greatly used of God. He said, there is greatness in life. The only way to have greatness in life is that when you have trouble, that it is born in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Trouble's gonna come. But greatness in life only comes when trouble is born in the spirit of Jesus Christ. In other words, you let God handle it. You let God help you in it and through it. The secret here is, as we go back to Psalm 35, and finish us up here tonight for a few minutes. The amazing thing here is, the very thing that David was facing is what made him a great man. And we all want God to enlarge us and strengthen us. But many times it's the difficulties of life that make us those things. And again, if we will handle them in the right way with God's help and with God's strength, those things will make us the people that we need to be. You see, when the people pursued him, 
David ran to God. When people sought him, David sought the Lord. When people fought against him, he gave it to God. Number three, and finally, and just we'll touch on this. Number three, not only the devices of the wicked, the dependence of David, but number three, and finally, the deliverance of God. The deliverance of God. And we read these verses in verses 15 down to the end of the chapter or the end of the psalm. I want you to see beyond King David. I want you to see a greater king. His name is Jesus. In verse 15, but in my adversity, they rejoiced. They gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. They did tear me and cease not. With hypocritical mockers and feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. Lord, how long would thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling from the lions. I will give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. Verse 19, let not them that are mine enemies wrongfully rejoice over me. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me without a cause. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Yea, they open their mouth wide against me and said, Aha, aha, our eye has seen it. This thou hast seen, O Lord. Keep not silence, O Lord, be not far from me. Stir up thyself and awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, so would we have it. Let them not say, We have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to the confusion together that rejoice in my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually that the Lord be magnified, which had pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and thy praise all the day long. Verse 17, again, we could spend a month on these, but verse 17 talks about the darling, you know, the darling Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God slain for us, slain from the foundation of the world, gave himself to be mistreated, gave himself to go through all that he went through and crucified. He allowed himself to become helpless. What's interesting thought and in this psalm is everything that David prayed that God would deliver him from, Jesus actually went to. David said, God, take me from this. And Jesus actually went to those things. <clears throat> Jesus delivered himself to those things. Jesus gave himself into the hands of angry sinners to do with them as they pleased. He suffered and he sacrificed. You see, what a thought, what a savior. Jesus was not rescued so that I could be and you could be. Jesus cried out but was not delivered so that you and I could be delivered. When you think about this, does it not make us want to give our hearts to the Lord? Amen. Give our hearts to him. And I want to deal with my troubles and problems the way that he would desire for me deal with them and leave them in God's hands. What a great psalm. What a great God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads about. Eyes are closed tonight. Maybe there's something you're going